Welcome to Opless TV. Today we have Jack Schwager, best-selling author of the Market Wizard series. He's just released his latest book, Market Sense and Nonsense, where he examines and challenges a lot of the traditional, long-standing belief systems in investing, particularly in academia and in investment management. Jack, can you talk to us about why you started this book, this work? Uh, well, for me, this book is personally the, the most important book that I've done. I'm sure most readers will, will not agree with that, and I have no problem with that. I'm sure most readers will point to one of the Market Wizard books as, as, as the most important for them. But for me personally, this was because it's sort of a compilation or a distillation of everything I've learned about, um, about what's right and wrong with investment and, and uh, trading and uh, performance evaluation, all these related uh, issues. And what I've observed over, the ma over many years is lots of things that are taken as gospel or just accepted, or even found thinking, when you actually look at it carefully, is, is just wrong. And, and what this, this, this book is about is all these precepts and beliefs and actions that people have in the investment world, all the way from you know, one side, the academics, to uh, professional investors, to traditional investment, and even hedge fund investment world, and the ordinary investor. All through that chain, people are accepting things or acting on, on beliefs that are just not, are not correct. And that's what this book is about, is sort of what, what are the wrong concepts that people have about investment, hence the market sense and nonsense. So that was the, the impetus for, for the book. I thought it would be a good idea to put all these things together as a book. It took me a while to figure out how to make it all work as one cohesive unit, more importantly, write it in a way that was accessible to the, uh, to the uh, regular investor, not necessarily the professional audience. Talk about why picking the best performing strategies is exactly the wrong thing to do, according to you and according to your latest book. Right, that's really one of the main things that everyone does wrong, from, from professionals down to just the ordinary investor. How do people pick their investments? Well, they go, they go and they find what looks best in the recent past, and that's what they'll, that's what they'll invest in, whether it's Morningstar, Five Star funds, or it's the hedge fund strategy that's been really doing well, or the hedge fund manager that's been doing particularly well. Um, and of course, you know, sometimes that could be the right thing to do, but what I'm basically saying is that it is shocking how, how poor a strategy of just picking the best performing strategy is in determining future returns. So yes, it'll tell you what did the best in the past, but does that, does that hold up in the future? And, and it really doesn't hold up at all. And this goes beyond, it's not just a matter of the disclaimer, you know, past return is no guarantee of future performance. And people kind of just say, oh yeah, that's a legal, legal thing they gotta say. And yeah, it is a legal thing they have to say, but you know what, in this particular case, it's true. You know, a, a past performance is not a predictor of future performance. And I did a number of exercises in this book, in one chapter where we deal with this. Uh, I, I looked at I'm picking picking the best um, the best uh, S and P sector. You got ten S and P sectors. What if you pick the best one of the past year, three years, or five years? Which I, you know, I looked at all three. What if you pick the or hedge funds? What if you pick the the best hedge fund strategy? HFR has like 34 strategies. Let's say you took the best performing strategy of the past one, three, and five years and took you know, representative managers in that strategy. Or um, and I also did it with the market as a whole. But bottom line. What I came up with is no matter how you do this exercise, you, you almost consistently find that, that picking the best doesn't, does worse than, than the average. So uh, certainly in return risk terms, it's even more extreme. So if you were to pick, if you divide your, S your money into 10 S&P sectors and equally balance every year, that will do much better than picking the best one of the past year or three or five years. If you divide your investments in all hedge fund strategies as opposed to picking the best one of the past one, three, and five years, that will do way better. But the shocking thing was that the worst performing strategy generally did better than the best performing strategy. And that's the thing I think most people would be really literally shocked to find. Uh, but there is, a, there is a rationale, there is an explanation for it uh, that makes sense once you think about it. So empirically it's true, but how, how can that be true? And it can be true because when something is the best, it means that, it's obviously, it's by definition, its returns have been going up a lot. Well, if it's in a sector, uh, or if it's a you know, manager, it means it's probably a manager who's concentrating in that sector. That means that in that particular sector, 
prices have been bid up very high. So that's going to imply that uh, prices are high, you'll get more supplies coming in, you'll get more competition, you'll get uh, demand, will, uh, well, the usage will be forced down, you'll get substitution, you'll get reduced usage for one reason or another, and the fundamentals will start to shift. But more importantly, when you get those type of big moves, the thing that is the strongest of all sectors, the hedge fund strategy that is making the most money, what happens? Investors flock into it. And that means that there's that the prices get bid up even more because the, the you know I'd like to say that that uh, major price moves begin on fundamentals and end on emotion, and that that end but that ending on emotion could be bigger than a whole move on based on fundamentals. So you get these overdone uh, portions of price moves, and and that has to correct. So you have you have you set up the seeds, you sow the seeds for changing fundamentals, and you have the natural uh, tendency for the market to correct overdone emotionalism. So that's why you can get the best performer of the past being the worst or, or worse than average going forward and why the worst performer can, can be better than average. So ironically, in fact, if I were forced in all situations to pick the best strategy versus the worst, I mean, I would, if I had to pick one or the other, I would feel more comfortable picking the worst. And like That's I say, it flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Why do you think focusing on returns alone is a huge mistake? Well, what I mean is that um, any, any manager, any investor, any trader can, can double their returns. And I can tell you instantly how to do it. Just double your exposure. Does that mean that you've become better? No. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. It just means you're taking twice as much risk. So my point is, a lot of times people make higher, make larger returns, nothing to do with skill. It's simply they're taking an inordinate amount of risk. So the only realistic measure is, is return to risk, not return alone. Because you can always increase return by any amount if you increase the risk by that amount or the or equivalently the exposure. So people who pay it, you know, people who look at returns and picking managers as, as, that, as that's a guideline are completely uh, off the mark because they won't distinguish between a manager. I mean, they'll look at a manager who makes 30% and has 50% drawdowns as being better than a manager who makes 10% and has 2% drawdowns. Well, they'd be much better off with the guy making 10% if they want the 30% returns. They, they, can, they can leverage the, the manager three to one and end up with the same type of returns with still much lower risk. So looking at return alone is, is meaningless. And I never, when I look at managers or evaluate managers, I never want to even, I never look at return alone. It, it, just, it just doesn't figure into the equation. It's always return relative to risk. Now there's different risk measures you can use and that's a, that's a point of distinction. But, but the fact that you got to normalize return relative to some risk, that's, that's always true. Another of your points is that leverage alone can tell you nothing about risk. Can you elaborate on that, please? I spent a number of years, as you know, working uh, with a hedge fund group, uh, the, uh, the hedge fund advisory uh, group in London. Uh, and, and over the course, had, of course, we had met a lot of allocators. And I was, well, I shouldn't say I was surprised, but the reality is that so many allocators have a checkbox mentality when it comes to leverage. And, you know, basically the thought is, uh, leverage is, you know, leverage is bad. Leverage is high risk. You know, leverage is, uh, you know, is everything negative. Uh, but no leverage is good. Low leverage is not much risk, and so forth. So it's a simplistic uh, model of, you know, leverage being risk and no leverage being no risk. And and this confu this is the complete confusion about between leverage and risk, and where. You can get leverage causing risk. And of course, this, this is like the long-term capital where one, and not certainly not the, maybe not even the main reason, but one of the important reasons that they blew up was because they, yes, they were extraordinarily over leveraged. There's a classic example where leverage was a key part of the risk. And, and yes, in that case, in that case, yes, leverage, extreme leverage does lead to risk. But that's not always the case. I, it's as a, there's a saying that uh, from, from Mark Twain, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says at one point, uh, the cat that sits on a hot stove will never sit on a hot stove again, nor a cold one. And that's, that's people when it comes to leverage. They'll never, yeah, they, they won't get caught in investing in a fund that is using leverage 
the increased risk, but they're also they also want to invest in funds that may be using leverage and really are using it in a in a way that might even reduce risk. They just they just react to the there's no distinction between the hot stove and the cold stove. It's all the same. Now, let's think about this. Leverage, right? So if you if you use leverage to just multiply your exposure and you're borrowing money, yeah, that can increase risk. But how about if you use leverage to de to, to hedge? So let's say I'm a, if I'm a, if I've got a portfolio of all long equities, um, and then I I use extra exposure and I use that extra exposure to to go short stocks. So now I'm inc I'm, I'm introducing leverage, but I'm reducing my risk. My net exposure is going down. So leverage can actually be risk reducing if it if it's used to hedge. In some cases it may be risk enhancing, in some cases risk reducing, but the mentality of considering all leverage the same is, is ridiculous. Um, it, it, it's, it goes back to that checkbox mentality. Leverage, no, we can't invest. Or we can only have two times leverage. Well, what if two times a market neutral fund so let's say you have one X, one X, you got two X right there. But let's say if let's say there's a there's a rule, we'll never invest in more than 1.5 leverage. Well, you're you're ruling out now market neutral funds as being too risky because they got a two X uh, face value. So that's what I'm basically saying. There, the, the point really the core is the following: risk is a function of the the amount of leverage and the investment. It's what is being leveraged. But to just consider the leverage without what the investment is makes absolutely no sense. It's a type of thinking will tell you that a, a 2x position in euro dollars is more risky than a 1x position in bonds, whereas the bonds have, have much greater duration and much greater volatility. And you know uh, the bonds at 1x are way more risky than the euro dollars at 2x. But the simplistic use of leverage as a, as a, as a proxy Will will tell you that that the two x position in euro dollars are, are riskier. So that's what I'm saying. You have to consider what's being leveraged, the underlying investment, and the leverage, not leverage alone. Tell us about how real risk can be hidden in track record. This ties in a little bit about the the, the you know, in, in the long lines of volatility. Not, not being the measure of risk and so forth. And the thing is that there are strategies out there where, where um, volatility does represent risk because they, they're liquid, they trade all the time, and you get episodes of up and down movements and you can see it in the amount of movement. But there are lots of strategies out there where the risk is not, is not how much exposure you have at the moment, mainly it's, it's the type of investment uh, which makes it vulnerable to certain episodes. It's, epi it's, it's occasional, it's sporadic risk. So uh, let's say credit funds, right? Uh, credit funds, uh, the plain vanilla version, they'll borrow money, uh, uh, they'll borrow 3x, 4x, whatever it is, and invest in, in riskier, in assets that pay a higher interest rate and make, and make the difference of the interest rate spread and the multiple of the times they're leveraging. So that type of model, if you get credit spreads are sort of not stable, or let alone if they're coming in, you won't see any. You won't see any risk there. It'll be very smooth. It'll be the track record. The risk is not. It's hidden. It's not in the track record because you have to go back to the point where there's an episode. So if a fund started post 2002, and while you're moving along before you get to 2007, 8, you don't see that risk. So that's what I call a hidden risk. The risk is there all the time. It's just that you didn't have the episode that would make that strategy sort of blow up or have a large loss. And lots of strategies have this, uh, their main risk is not an ongoing risk of like a, like a global macro where there's trading risk and your positions are wrong or right and therefore you have this movement constantly. But in many strategies the risk is episodic and that's why I say it may be hidden because it may not be evident in a track record. And that's the big flaw in just using, just looking at the track record and assuming that tells you what the, what, the, what the return risk of the fund is because you may not have the risk event in the track record. Jack, you say that there's a lack of relevant data within the academic community and within the investment management world. What do you see here? Why is there a lack of relevant data with which to make investment decisions? A lot of times you don't have the data to, 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 to draw the conclusions of, 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 what, of what the return risk characteristics really are. Uh, or what the, let's focus it in even more on what the, what the real risk is. So the, 
So, for example, the whole, the whole mortgage uh, fiasco uh, that happened uh, in the late 2000s, basically we reached a point where you had such uh, actors as Countrywide, <clears throat> as everybody knows, were, were, were giving out mortgages, you know, not only to, not only to people who weren't putting down any, any assets, but people who had no job, no income, uh, there was no verification of, one, of any sort. You got to the point where if anybody for somehow didn't get approved, they would, uh, the, the loan officer would, would be reprimanded and said to find a way to make, uh, to make the mortgage. So as long as you were alive, or maybe if they could get past that, that wasn't even necessary, but anybody could, could get a mortgage. Now, that's what's being packaged into these, uh, into these secure, securitizations. Now, of course, the mortgage provider, like, like Countrywide, doesn't care because they sell it off. And Wall Street didn't care because they were selling it off. So that's why the, the incentives worked that nobody cared about the risk. However, think about that in terms of all products related to that. You're doing analysis saying, what is the, what is the probability? You have all these mathematical models saying, what is the probability of a certain percentage of mortgages failing? Well, how are you ever going to be able to determine that when never in history was there anything remotely like the current situation where mortgages were, given, were being given away where you knew that people couldn't, couldn't pay back the mortgage and, and unless housing prices kept on rising forever at a rapid cl uh, clip. There was no historical precedence. There absolutely was no data to use. So the realistic answer is there is no data. You, you can't evaluate that. You know, the risk could be anything, but no, what do they do? They, they use historical models of, of mortgage defaults. Well, historical models of mortgage defaults are completely irrelevant because they don't have anything to do with the, with the quality, or I should say the lack of quality, of mortgages being written at that time. So that's a classic example of insufficient data. In that case, I would argue there was no relevant data, and, and, and the rating agencies really couldn't make any assumption about the risk because, because they, the, the mortgages had, had no tie into past events. So using, using past data to draw conclusions not only, some, not only sometimes may it not hold up, but sometimes it can actually be an inverse indicator. And so you always have to ask yourself the question, <clears throat> is the past data relevant? Because if it's not relevant, then the conclusions are, are, are going to be completely wrongly directed. So take, for example, take the whole subject of portfolio optimization. Um, portfolio optimization is the mathematically right answer to the question of what combination of investments would have given you the best return risk in the past. It's the only the right answer for the future if there's a reason to believe that those same return risk, or I should say return volatility and correlation levels hold up again in the future. But if that assumption is not valid, if there is no reason to assume, let's say, that past returns have any indication about future returns, and even worse, if, you, if there's an argument to say the reverse, then that's going to lead you to totally erroneous conclusions. So take the bond market in the current, in the current situation. As we talk uh, in late 2012, we've got a situation where the bond market is, is in a plus 30-year bull market. Now, bonds of price have literally been going up for more than three decades. So any portfolio optimization process is going to look at this and say, well, bonds are or, well, they don't have that much volatility, they've been going good returns, it's going to be a very good component of a, of a portfolio, and you should have a good mix of bonds in your portfolio because they just, the numbers are really good. Well, think about it. Why are, why are bonds, what does that mean, bonds have been up for over 30 years? Well, it means that they're up for 30 years because interest rates have come down for 30 years. Well, if interest rates have come down in 30 years, and where are they now? Well, long-term rates are somewhere, you know, in the 3% 3 so odd vicinity. But you've gone from 15% long-term rates to 3%. Now, if you believe you can go from 3% to negative 12% interest rates, then yeah, the bonds are a great investment. But if instead you stop to think for a second and say, wait a minute, if they're down to 3%, not only isn't the past you know, decline of 12% in interest rates a poor indicator, it's, it's the totally misleading indicator because the fact that we're so low now not only means that you can't get that type of move again, it means that if anything, there's much more variability than the upside, unless, uh, unless you believe that long-term rates can go negative. I mean, maybe real rates can go negative, but certainly nominal long-term rates can, can't go negative. So you have a situation where the past strong returns not only aren't meaningful for the future in a, in a direct implication, 
they actually have the reverse implication. Because, because rates are so low now, you have an increased chance that they will be higher in the future. Uh, and therefore, any conclusion you draw about past returns is going to be almost opposite to what you're really looking for in terms of it having a guide, being a guideline for the future. Another issue that you see is that, primarily in the academic community, there's an assumption that prices will adhere to normal distribution. Why is this inaccurate? Academics um, basically you know, love the normal distribution and make that its an underlying assumption. Now, the, the good thing for them is that prices do, many prices do roughly approximate normal distributions. But what's law, and the reason they do this is because it makes things very quantifiable. You can assign probabilities to certain price moves happening. It has very nice qualities. It's, um, the analogy I use, it's, it's like uh, the drunk looking for his, his keys that he dropped under the lamppost, not because he remembers that's where he dropped them, but that's the only spot in the street that has light. So the, you know, the academics, again, use the normal distribution, not because it's necessarily the right thing to do, but because every, the math works out very nicely. And you answer, you saw a lot of insolvable problems become solvable by doing that. But it, it, it's so easy to prove uh, that, that this is wrong. You, in fact, the, all, all I need to do is just pull out, and I'll just take one example that I use from the book. If you take the, the 1987 crash, the October 1987 crash, that, that is uh, that 29% that decline in one day. The probability of that is, uh, it is so extraordinarily remote. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. So to, to put it in, in terms of numbers that have so many zeros, that it's hard for people to relate. So I came up with an analogy. And fortunately, the Wolfgang uh, site had an estimate of number of atoms in the universe. And it's like 10 to the 80th. And well, it turns out that the, um, that the probability of that event happening, um, this number of standard deviations, if the normal distribution was right, is 10 to the 160th. Now, 10 to the 160th is 10 to the 80th times 10 to the 80th. What that means is that the probability, if, if, the, if that's the big if, if the normal distribution is correct, that the odds that you could get the October 87 crash are as likely as picking one random atom from the entire universe and then doing, this, doing that exercise a second time and picking the same random atom a second time in a row. I, I mean, this is beyond impossible. So I don't know what you have to do beyond just cite that one example and say it can't possibly be right.